And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, and welcome to another episode of And Now for Something Complete Machinima. I'm Damien Valentine, and I'm joined by Phil Rice. Hello. And Tracy Harwood. Hello. Um, Ricky is still uh, having a really terrifying time at his uh, convention. Um, <laughs> I hope he's enjoying himself. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about a film this week that Tracy, you have chosen for us. So uh, tell us about it, please. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out how to say the creator's name. Lol, Rick? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Lol, if, I, if I... If I mm. uh, if I make a mistake uh, and have totally butchered that, I do apologise. Anyway, yes, by Lol Rick. Um, this is Assault on T Fort. And actually, this isn't really my pick. I've got to be honest. It was one of the commentators um, on that absolutely stunning work um, that we looked at in episode 135 by Daminsky called The Wanderer. Um, and this was a recommendation that came through a discussion on on that particular film, um, which was actually also a source um, film. So this week's project then took at least, I think, two years to realise. It began, uh, the, the creative work on it began in around 2020 with some of the clips um, having even been done as early as 2018. And it's a, a project that's been uh, led by, by J.P. Stevens, known as Lol Rick, <laughs> um, who actually describes himself as a YouTuber. Um, it's a little longer than some of the machinimas we review at, at 12 and a half minutes. Uh, and I think the original aim was to have this released as a longer format film of actually around 30 minutes. Um, but in the end, given the amount of effort that went into it, or has gone into it, it's being released episodically. This part that we're discussing this week being the first episode um and as we stand here at the moment we are still waiting for part two um to be released although there is a trailer for it which i'll put a link on as well for those of you that are particularly interested now lol rick has said that he has struggled to continue the story basically because he's been making it more and more ambitious um which has basically meant that the project just got bigger and probably more challenging as a consequence. I'm sure you guys will all um, appreciate that sort of uh, yeah. reflection. Um, I think for what it's worth, um, longer format uh, machinimas can be really quite hard to watch. So maybe the way to go isn't bigger, but to go smaller. Uh, and then to have in mind that making a feature is never just um you know just stitching the shorts together in um i think the internet is full of unfinished short series projects and many of them i think are a reflection of the fact that life moves on um probably beyond this kind of crazy uh creative passion that that you know we all kind of share through um creating and and, and watching machinima all of that said, I think this creator is committed to making the part, um, the second part of it. Um, I just kind of wish him all the very best in doing that. Now, the plot for this particular film, this first part, um, well, it's obviously an excerpt um, from an evidently long running battle between these two factions, Red and Blue. It um, starts with a raid by Blue on Red. Uh, which leads to a kind of a retaliation on Blue's base. And the story is very much told from Red's perspective. These are a group of four characters, including, including the, the main focal character, who really interestingly for Team Fortress is actually a girl scout. 
that's, I think, an interesting take on it. Now, what's impressive about this is actually the fight choreography between the two sides over what appears to be a fairly extensive map, despite, I think, not, uh, well, we know next to nothing about the characters beyond what you know of the game. So um, I think it's quite interesting, actually, that you can clearly see who is on which side and how they are performing in the running battles. And I don't think I got a sense at any point of losing who's on what side, who's red, who's blue, which is an interesting point because there are quite a lot of characters in it. Um, there's an impressive depth of emotion to por portrayed by the characters. I got sense of fear and trepidation, bravado, camaraderie, respect between the individuals. And then things like um, hatred and spite towards each of the opposing um, faction members. Um, but like I said, the story is mainly told from the red side of things. You definitely appreciate who the blue characters are too, though. So they're not, you know, they're not sort of, oh, we're going to put it all from this side and we're going to just paint these other guys in a, you know, in a, in a lesser way. That's not really how this has been done. Um, so I think there's multiple layers going on with this, which make it really interesting. So you've got fight choreography, but you've also got the relationship between the characters as well. Fascinating um, depth to it. I thought the camera angles, the sound design and the edit um, with it were actually really very well done. Um, the, the layering is what I really um, picked out on the most though. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we were having conversation with Ricky's pick this month, where the, the horror of what was portrayed in that just, <laughs> just really shocked me. But you know what? There's horror in this too, but it didn't shock me in the same way. And maybe, Phil, when you talk about your take on it, you can perhaps explain why that might be the case. Um, now, there's another really interesting aspect to this, which I liked, which was how the um, the red versus the blue context were conveyed and it and it was as subtle and as complex really as basically a background filter that you saw so you really knew the reds were the red because of the color of the the scene and you really knew the blue were the blue and you knew the moment that you went from red to blue because of the way the um the background scene changed color which i thought was was a was a was a fascinating way of indicating how that transition between which side you were on was was conveyed without actually telling you as much with any um dialogue um that sort of indicated well now we're going to this and now we're doing that it it wasn't there it was just the way it was conveyed these atmospheric colors were were brilliantly um conveyed um and you and you you simply just got the measure of what was happening and who was on on which side because of that and what was quite interesting with that was actually at the end somehow the background colors were switched um quite deliberately i suspect but you still knew who the, who the characters were because by then you knew who was whom and how they related to one another which i thought you know that that relational depth was 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 working just as hard as um, some of the choreography effects that were being used. Um, right, in terms of the story arc, I think it's kind of worth commenting, actually. We're, we're caught up in a war here. You know nothing about who these groups of folks are or, or why they're fighting, how they came to be on each other's side, etc. You don't know any of that. They're just presented together as, uh, you know, that, that that's the way it is. Now, it's clearly drawing on uh, the, the game law, um, which I think is probably, you know, the, you know, if you come at this from not being very familiar with with um, Team Fortress, you won't be familiar with the, with the game law, but I don't actually think it matters too much um, in terms of the story arc that you're, that you're getting and the, and the way these two sides are, are conveyed. The fact that you don't know too much about the game is not, not so important but i think if if what's being done here is to pay an homage to the game 
then that presents it in a slightly different light and it does become more challenging to make this accessible to a to a, a wider audience and i suspect that the struggle this creator is having in coming up with part 2 is that do i you know do i go down the law route or do i bring in a new dimension route and i and i'm guessing that because this has been developed with um so much attention to the community of followers that that's a very fine line to sort of um tread in the creative process because you're going to have lots of folks that are very into the game law and what you're trying to do is perhaps build out something a little bit different um so i think that's probably kind of all i would say on it really i mean i think we've seen lots of machinimas do something like this um and also lots of folks never actually complete a, a, a significant um project like this um so you know i really enjoyed it i i thought it was i thought it was it was really interesting on so many different levels i hope to hopefully i've managed to convey that um definitely encourage you to finish it because i'm really looking forward to seeing the next part of it um so guys what did you think go ahead damien all right um i was i got so many thoughts on this one <laughs> um one of the first thing that came to mind was usually in these films we have a, a red team and a blue team because they're made with Team Fortress or Halo or something like this. It's told from the story of the blue team and the oh. red team are usually are portrayed as the bad guys. And okay, red versus blue is a comedy so it doesn't really matter that much. But a lot of these other films where they try and tell a more serious story, it's always the blue team's the heroes and the red team's are the bad guys. I don't know why, it just seems to be the way it's done. And the first thing that struck me is this. This is told from the perspective of the red team. And I don't know if that's a deliberate choice or just doing something different or what, but I, I kind of liked that it was reversed that way. Um, but yeah, this is made with the source filmmaker. And as we discussed uh, a few times before, the source filmmaker is a really hard piece of software to use and well, just to learn. It's. I think someone once told me it's like sitting in front of a seven four seven, in uh, in a cockpit and just looking at the controls, and having no idea what to do. Um, so when you see something like this, and it is so flawlessly animated, and there's so much attention to detail to the animation and the the facial expression, um, uh, you know that's really hard to pull off. But then you also got this element of it's a fairly lo this film is a fairly long action sequence. There's some calmer moments throughout, but mostly it's focused on the action. Action sequences are hard to pull off. So when you've got no matter even if you're using um you know, something like GTA or something which is designed for action, it's still hard to do a good, you know, sequence. So when you've got a piece of software like Source Filmmaker, which is already incredibly hard to use, and then you've got the, the challenge on top of that of doing something like this. Uh, I'm not surprised it took two years to do it and why you're struggling to, with part two. I hope he finishes part two because I really want to see more of this. It was so impressive and so well done. Probably my favourite pick of the month, uh, just because of the amount of work that must have gone into pulling this off. And the, the action was flawless. Um mm -hmm. And yeah, it's very gory, uh, a little bit over the top. I don't know if the actual game is that gory or if he's if this is added an extra. Um, it appealed to my dark sense of humor a little bit, which we discussed this before we recorded, and I was surprised that <laughs> you two weren't quite so amused by it as I was. Um, so maybe I need to watch it again with a slightly more serious take on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, this is one of those films where if you're planning to do an action sequence in your own film, watch something like this because it'll give you a lot of ideas, a lot of inspiration of how, you know how to play, how to move the camera, where to focus, um, um, you know all of that stuff. And yeah, I I'm struggling here now because I could just praise this on and on. And I'll just end up repeating myself because I was blown away by how impressively well animated and uh, um, it was. And yeah, please do finish part two. I'd really like to see it. 
uh, I did have a look. As soon as I finished watching it, I went to the channel to look for it, and I just saw the trailer, but there's no sign of it itself. So um, mm. whatever struggles you're going through, I, I hope you uh, figure it out. Uh, and then, you know, we can see it. And I imagine we'll review that one as well at some point uh, when we see it. So uh, I wish you luck. All right. So here's my question to kick things off here is. What is the lore for Team Fortress 2? Or maybe the better way to put it is. Is there actually a lore? So here's I... why I'm asking that. Uh, Team Fortress originally started off. As a free mod for the game Quake. And essentially, it was it was like a more advanced version of a capture the flag scenario. You've got two teams and an objective, combat based objectives on either side, right? And whoever gets the job done first wins. And what Team Fortress added to that, you know, traditional capture the flag in those games was just four equal players or however many equal players on each team. And it's just about, it's just death match and strategy and can you outrun and all that. And what team fortress added was this idea of player classes. Mm -hmm. So player classes would have different abilities. Um, so, you know, there's, there's one player that specialized in stealth and there's another class that specialized in dem demolition and another one that carries a really big gun and, you know, and all of that. And so Team Fortress 2 was really just building more on that idea. And not only did the different classes exist, but they actually invested in creating personalities to go with those types. And so not just in their look, but in their voice and in their movement and everything. And so it 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 made the whole experience of it uh, more engaging and more interesting to look at while still preserving the core gameplay of these team-based, class-based battles, right? Um, I'm not aware of any developer-based lore other than the, the fact that these, you know, that these classes have personalities, and then there's kind of implied, I'm not sure how much is by the developers of the game and how much of it is what players have constructed around it, but the idea of, well, they have personalities, therefore they have backstories. You know, why are they that way? You know? So I, I can't help but wonder if if there's, and he even refers to the lore in his description, doesn't he? Saying that he decided not to really emphasize that or go down that route or something along those lines. And I found myself thinking, what lore? And it, it just makes me wonder, like, did the lore around this game emerge organically from the players over however many, I mean, it's more than two decades that this game has been played in some form or another. Um, so, yeah, that's that's interesting to me because, I, I mean, you can scroll through the Wikipedia article for Team Fortress 2. And there's no mention of lore. Mm. There's no mention of story of any kind, really. They do describe the personalities of the classes, but there's no actual backstory to why these teams are competing, you know? So I think if that does exist, that has evolved in a sort of fan fiction universe, which is really interesting, that it would evolve and that it would be there, that means there must be some elements of it that were agreed upon by the community of players and embraced as lore. There's certain elements of that you can see in other mm -hmm. in other game and film universes. Star Wars comes to mind the most. Star Wars has a, a huge uh, fan fiction universe and you know unofficial add-ons to the to the Star Wars universe and stuff. So it, it kind of feels like that sort of dynamic that this was fan generated so i don't know i just found it interesting that whatever that is it's it appears to be unofficial and yet it's so widely recognized 
that he made a point to say, the, the filmmaker made a point to say, yeah, I'm not going that direction. Mm -hmm. And to me as an outsider, I'm going, what direction? You know, does this even really exist? So it's it's that's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, there's a lot to like here. Um, I, first of all, I was, the film that we covered earlier this month where uh, Ricky's pick and Tracy was, was really blanching at the graphic violence in it. And I'm just, at first I thought she was talking about her own pick, this film, because what I was remembering about this film was, this is the first time in a long si time that I've seen one of the main characters walk around with a smear of blood across their face, <laughs> yeah. like a full on <laughs> smear of someone else's blood or picking up someone else's body to absorb bullets. Like it's Bruce Willis in Die Hard or something or heads being completely blown off by this girl's shotgun. That's I was like a wow graphic. So why? Yeah, that's a good question. Crazy. Why? Did the violence in this, even though you noticed it, but why did it not give you this visceral negative reaction like it did in Ricky's? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, they both are potentially disturbing depictions, right? Mm. Um, but I think it may come down to this. You know, there's the violence of war, which is awful, but it, it, there's some kind of underlying purpose to it. It doesn't mean that it's not got moral problems, right? War does. But it's something we can easily understand. And that's the violence that's depicted here, essentially, is the violence of war. This is people defending themselves. If I don't kill you, you're going to kill me kind of thing. And I think the violence in Ricky's pick was just full on sadism, just full on psychopathic behavior someone seeming to maybe take a little pleasure in mutilating the body of another person. And that is more disturbing, period, in any context. We could, if we wanted to take the podcast in this direction, we could reference some historical things that have happened in the past 12 months where that was pretty clearly illustrated as well, but we're not going to do that. So, yeah. That's that's why I think the violence was more disturbing in, in Ricky's pick is the context. Context was that was a monster of a person who was delighting in tearing up another human being. And these are soldiers fighting for their lives. And yes, it's it's bloody and it's nasty and it's awful, but that's what it is. It could also just be that this is a little more cartoonish, but I don't think it's just that. This violence is really graphic. There's body parts flying and you know, bodies falling downstairs and and a lot of death, right? So I don't think the cartoonish covers that. So uh, <clears throat> visually, this film is uh, amazing. Um, the use of color, I didn't really take the use of the red and blue. You you mentioned his background. It's really about the lighting of the, the mm. sets. I, I, I felt like that it was more used as a cue to where you are. Uh, not who you're looking at, because there was a point about the halfway point where the red team is invading blues territory and now everything's in the blue, but you're still following the red characters. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that may, maybe that's even in the game in the original capture the flag. And in the original team fortress, the maps were built with color cues like that to let you know right. whose territory you were in. So that could just be territorial markings in the game. I'm not sure. Um, but it was used extremely effectively. It really helped orient you to not just who you were looking at, but where they were. Um, so yeah, that was that was great. The the emotional content. I can't remember the exact term that you used to describe it, Tracy. The the but yeah, it's really rich in this. Um, it's maybe little things, and, isn't it? Yes. It's little little things like one of the big. Big chaps puts put his hand around the on the on the girl's shoulder at one point, and I thought, what is that relation? I mean, are they is is that an orphan child yeah. scout? Or you know, it was just the deep little tiny details that. My favorite example of it, my favorite example of it is when she first comes back to the red base, 
with yeah. the blood all over her and she's just come in and she goes and starts to wash up and then just turns and looks at her male compatriots in the room, just gives them a look. And then they all get up and leave and shut the door so that she can disrobe. Yeah. Nothing said, not, not by her. Brilliant. Brilliantly done. Um, yeah, she was silent the whole, the whole film, wasn't she? I mean, we heard her so. breathe heavy, but I don't think she spoke at all. And I, I wasn't really clear whether it's because her character was mute or because she was just choosing not to speak. Works either way, frankly. Uh, but she was very quiet. But she expressed so much uh, because of the way that they animated her, because of liberal uses of close-ups to let us know what she's thinking. There was one very iconic shot where she's just finished some combat in this rather fully lit area, and suddenly you hear the sound of and the lights go down. And we're just left with a little bit of light shining on her face as she turns her head. Just beautiful, beautifully done. Like, And, and in her eyes, there's this sense of fear and a little intrepidation and okay what what's happening and and yet not not cowering fear right the fear of a soldier all communicate without anybody saying a word that's just man you you can't i don't think you can teach that that's just that's a gift man someone involved in this just wow wonderful wonderful visual storytelling I'm less impressed with the sound. Um, the sound felt a little bit hodgepodge. There's a lot of problems with the mix, stuff that's too loud or too soft or too repetitive or not good positioning in the pan. Um, you know, that could use some work on this, some serious work. Um, but visually, I mean, there's... Uh, it's just a delight. It really is. And 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 the visuals are so strong and the the storytelling through mostly through nonverbal, through animation, are so strong. And the combat sequences, brutal as they are, I mean, they're they're brilliantly animated and edited. Like the, it's there's a logic to them. There's a belief, a believability to them in the context of this slightly cartoonish Team Fortress 2 world. The way that everybody behaves and the way that people fall when they are, you know, taken out of commission and everything just feels like it fits and lays naturally in that world. And I, I don't know enough about this game to know how much of that is just a function of the engine and how much of it's custom animated. But I I suspect there's a lot of custom work that went on here to get those results. I mean, games... Games are good and all, but I mean, this was so precise and so picture perfect that it's it, frankly hard to imagine that the game just spits that out in a, a game that's essentially just a bunch of combat, you know? Uh, this was very artistically done. So um, yeah, I liked it. No idea really what the story is. Um, and I don't know anything about, uh, like you said, the the even the the general lore of the game other than you know the game premise but there's not really a story to that you know there's not a, a story needs a why and there's no why in the story of team fortress 2 mm. but what's interesting is this story doesn't even address the why question and yet i wasn't bothered by that mm. for some reason just like you described tracy i just felt like I, I was just led along and I was okay. Like that for some reason, I didn't need to understand that to enjoy this. Um, Damien, you brought up a really interesting point about the red being the good guys. What's interesting is to analyze, because I got that message too. How? Hmm. How did they convey that? Like, what about what about their actions identified them as the good guys? They're they're just soldiers, just like who they're up against, right? But there was yeah. something compelling that made you. Maybe the good guys isn't the right term. Maybe it's more about empathy. Mm -hmm. 
And they did something in this to elicit empathy. And I don't think it's just that it was a female lead, which is going to tend to, for anybody who's not a jerk, it's going to attend, tend to elicit a little more empathy. The idea of this, this feminine and maybe a little vulnerable character having to do these these really hard soldiery things. We've talked about that about some previous picks probably a year ago. The one that was all the, the cinematic footage of like Laura Croft and Last of Us and all that. And it was all these female leads, these, these, these very feminine women being put in these situations where they have to do uh, things that typically you would only see men do in film, right? Mm -hmm. There was something like really moving about that. So maybe it's just that. But that doesn't account for that undeniable good guy vibe about the Reds. Maybe it's the camaraderie that you want to assume that if if people are treating their own like that, then they should they are thought of by us as good guys, right? That's the way the good guys behave to each other. Um, this is the second time, second or third time this month I've brought up Battlestar Galactica. If, if I haven't already betrayed what it is I'm re-watching this month on Amazon, <laughs> it's all up in my kitchen right now. But basically, it's the difference between the humans and the Cylons, right? Why is Adama the good guy? Because of how he treats his people, because he cares, because he puts himself at risk to help them. And the Cylons, you don't see a whole lot of that with them, really, right? It's, it's a very black and white. So... Maybe that's what's going on with us seeing Red as the good guys is they did give us a glimpse of that with them. But that being said, there wasn't really anything in here that explicitly identified the blue teams as the bad guys. Hmm. It's just that that's... No, they're behaving in pretty it's much like the, the same team. way. We don't see yeah. their camaraderie because we don't get as much alone time with them, but... Hmm. You know the one, the one, uh, the one guy who's down and mm. is presumed dead, and he's there. You can see his eyes open, but his hat brim is covering him. Right, just a brilliant mm. scene. And you can see his eyes moving, and without him saying anything, we know what he's thinking. How do I get out of this? How can I turn the tables here? That's not bad guy behavior. That's not any. Yeah. That's not bad or good. That's just somebody trying to not die. Right. So, yeah. Really interesting. I don't know the answer. I'm asking the question, but I don't know the answer. Why did we think the red are the the good guys? Mm -hmm. It's not. It's it's hard to deny that that's the feeling. But uh, what led us that way? I don't know. But I love it. I love it. It wasn't. It definitely wasn't anybody saying something that's explicitly good guy or bad guy talk, or it wasn't somebody wearing a black hat and a white hat or any of those tropes nothing like that whatever was happening was much more complex than that and, and much more subtle uh, i just love that so my misgivings about the sound aside uh yeah i i, I totally would anticipate the the second part of this uh film because this the storytelling is just it's just top notch so really really great pick dominsky and tracy thank you uh, I'm I'm really glad this was recommended to us. It's 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 really really worth watching. Absolutely. To answer your first question, Phil, does the game have a law? Um, I had a quick look because initially I thought the law was there's a blue team and there's a red team and they fight. And right. that's is, you're right. That's how it started. Um, it seems like because the game was so popular that there was demand for some kind of backstory to it so there were uh, some official comics that were published wow really but, yeah years after team fortress 2 so yeah it, it did launch without a story on without official any intent yeah and I, I just i found this article and it's quite an extensive backstory which i'm not going to recite now because okay it's... well let's let's add that to the list of links uh for this episode yeah yeah I'll wow put so the uh, actual uh, creators came back and added lore at fan request and basically yeah. set up some canon story. 
Wow. Yeah. And then I I've think never heard fans, of that. Yeah, I think fans then added their bits to it sure. as well. Give them something um, to run with. Yeah, because all I knew is you had the two teams and you could customize the characters. But the two teams, the characters on the two teams are identical. I don't know that what they're called, but the only way to tell the difference between them is the color of their clothes. But they've yeah. got the same faces and the same voices, same mannerisms, same weapons and all of that. It's just that the outfits are different. Um, huh. So I don't think any thought was ever intended for story until people asked for sure. it. Sure. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and, I've never heard of something like that happening. Have you? No. As far as a game, you know, that was built that way, but then adding that on later. No. Wow. But the story goes back to 1822, apparently. So there's quite a lot, a long oh. backstory to the game. Wow. Yeah, send me that. Uh, put that link on the board for sure. I, 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 I'm very interested in that now, not because of the game, but because of this film. Yeah, it's kind uh, of made me realize the, the story and narrative potential that there is with these, and I wouldn't have imagined that really, other than seeing Dominsky's film last month and then this one. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's really kind of opened my eyes to a narrative corridor I had never looked down. Yeah. We've seen some really interesting films made in um with source really, haven't we, this year? Yeah. Which I which actually I wasn't expecting to because, you know, as we sort of said, you know, Unreal has been the go to engine and yet the best quality of the machinima type content that we've seen has not come out of that quarter at all. Which I think you know, when we do our annual review, I think that will be a really interesting um, discussion that we'll have about what we've seen and why we think we've seen it in that way. But these films are brilliant. We've we've seen, I mean, the you know the one the one we saw, uh, Dominsky's film, um, but we also saw Emesis Blue as well, which was a right a you know a feature length that was um, fantastic, brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Um, and a whole load of others as well that we've kind of, um, you know, touched on. Um, so it's by no means, you know, a unique sort of set of films. There's a whole community of creators that are getting stuck in with Source, which is fascinating. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I feel like that this is one of those moments when Rick, Ricky would remind us that uh, good story in a game inspires good stories. Yeah. You know, and say all you want for Unreal Engine. It's got arguably some of the most beautiful visually stories that we've seen. Mm. But the Unreal Engine environment itself does not inspire stories. No, so some, just... that means that anyone who's going to make a good story in that, they have to come with it in their bag already. Right. Yes. And we've yeah. seen that. There's the one I'm thinking of where it was the... The female oh. hoverboarder set in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, oh flight, yeah. yes. Right. That was brilliant. But Unreal Engine didn't inspire that story at all. They just made it, you know, easier to tell it in a beautiful way. So, yeah. And Ricky, Ricky's always been an observer of that, that that's why he's so many are attracted to Red Dead Redemption. What an, op what an opportunity Rockstar blew there, in my opinion, mm -hmm. by not yeah. having movie making tools. Hmm. Um, to some degree, Grand Theft Auto, that's the case. Um, the story there is, it's a little harder to riff on, I feel like, um, than something with characters that may be a little bit more likable, um, but it's there. Mm. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, there's there's countless other examples. And the world of Half-Life 2 just is some of the most exceptional world, world building ever. And then, yeah, they, they injected... Late in the game, they injected some story into this and look at the result. That's amazing. Because I, I mean, whether or not these films we've mentioned are directly inspired by that lore, very likely, very possible they're not. But story breeds story, you know? So it, it gets you thinking about that game in that way. And I think the greatest counter example is Doom. I've never, ever, ever seen a compelling doom story-based machinima never yeah. <laughs> because the original game doesn't have a compelling or interesting story no it's got an interesting premise and it's it, not it's not wholly original either i mean the whole 
evil coming through a portal thing. They didn't invent that. They just they just did it well, but it's not enough to build on there. And there's no empathetic character at all in that. And that's the result. And Doom, why, which is yeah. one of the most popular games of all time. And it's been had how many different versions over the last couple decades? Mm -hmm. But no, I've never seen a fan-made machinima in that it's about anything other than blowing shit up. Well, even the actual official <laughs> Doom movie, that was terrible too. I mean, it had Kyle Urban and he's usually good, but there wasn't really any story to that either. No, <laughs> it was it, awful. And it didn't actually, I know Doom doesn't have a story, but no, it didn't even stick to that. It didn't have no. demons coming through a portal. They did it as a zombie movie, most. basically. Yeah. 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 No, it was awful. Yeah. But you get, yeah, the, the, there was no, it was not fertile soil. But again, that wasn't its strength. And it wasn't their focus either. I mean, when 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 they were making the originals of these games, it was it was John Carmack at the helm that had much more influence than John Romero. John Romero's a story guy. Hmm. Um, I think that's part and parcel why he pulled away and went his own direction when he did, because he's a story guy for sure. And John Carmack is a technical wizard. Hmm. He's a genius. And so his thing was, let's make the baddest ass graphics engine that the whole world has ever seen. And then we license it. And so really Doom, all every Doom game was really just, we get to watch their development of that as they innovate, innovate, innovate. And that's, you know, that that's okay. Um, but yeah, if you're after story. So yeah, this is, this has all been very interesting. Uh, I, I, wonderful pick great picks all month actually yeah, yeah i've enjoyed all four films so all right um that's it for uh, us this uh month um thank you to uh phil and tracy for joining me uh if you'd like to talk about this film or team fortress to let us know about the law uh if you want to talk about the law of doom or the lack of it uh <laughs> please pew, uh, pew, pew. <laughs> uh, please send us an email at talk at complete the machine and uh, hopefully ricky is having a great time um terrifying people at this horror convention um and we'll be back next month with some more films so see you then bye bye, -bye.